Welcome to Fight News Now Extra. I'm John Pollock as we enter a new week with lots of news to discuss as John Randin is going to join me to chat about all of it. Today we're discussing the fallout of Tiago Silva's UFC release, Jessica I's drug test results from UFC 166, and Anderson Silva's recovery continues. Former UFC middleweight champion Anderson Silva posted a video over the past couple of days demonstrating how his recovery process is going. Silva is seen in the video walking down a flight of stairs unassisted and no longer wearing a cast or needing any crutches. Silva broke his leg on December the 28th in the closing seconds of his fight with Chris Weidman at UFC 168 and he's hopeful of returning to fight again within the next year. Bloody Elbow is reporting that the substance Jessica I tested positive for following her UFC 166 bout with Sarah Kaufman was marijuana following other reports that it had been for blood thinners. The announcement that her win was being overturned to a no decision was made by the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation last week and putting her under quote probationary suspension which means I can still fight at UFC 170 later this month. The Texas Commission has yet to confirm the substance that was detected in I's system. And in the wake of Tiago Silva's release from the UFC, it had left Ovon St. Peru without an opponent for UFC 171 next month in Dallas, but he will get to fight. It's been announced that Nikita Krylov is cutting down to 205 pounds and he's gonna fight St. Peru March the 15th in Dallas, Texas. Krylov debuted in the UFC last August, losing to Soa Palele at UFC 164 and rebounded with an 18 second victory over Walt Harris last month on the Fox 10 undercard where Krylov came in at 218 pounds. And I'm here with John Ramdeen, Robin Black, still MIA. I worry about that man. Not when me, he, not me. He's on a beach drinking tequila somewhere in Mexico. There is a history of this man. When he leaves the country, bad things happen. We call it the Robin Blackout phase. We hope he returns safe and sound. Uh, man that's not going to be returning anywhere, it looks like, at least uh, to a fighting organization in the near future, is Tiago Silva, who, let's be honest, innocent till proven guilty is uh, the mantra, I believe, of our friends to the south of Canada. But nonetheless, uh, Nikita Krylov now seeing this opportunity, he wanted to cut to light heavyweight regardless, has come in very light for his fights, 218 pounds against Walt Harris, and with 18 seconds, easy turnaround for him here, and now gets to fight Ovon St. Preux in Dallas. So I think you're gonna see a lot of these fighters, when spots open up, you wanna get these fights in, you're gonna have to take fights on short notice to get in your three fights a year if you want that. Yeah, and I, you know, I've been a big proponent of this for years, about guys, moving back and forth between weight classes. And I think for Krylov, that, I think this is a great move. I think you should still focus on heavyweight and light heavyweight. Just take the biggest fights, the most interesting fights, and however you can climb the ranks, do it. Are you able to climb, though, if you're bouncing back and forth? I mean, taking a fight here, a fight there, it doesn't really allow you to kind of climb up, does it? I think it just depends on your opponent, the type, the type of performance that you have. It's just like, for example, like Jose Aldo. And I know we're talking about one of the pound-for-pound -pound best fighters in the world. Sure. But this guy leaves 100 145 pounds and immediately gets a title shot at 155 pounds. So I think you just have to separate yourself. And if you can get a you know a couple of big wins over some big name guys like Daniel Cormier, for example, this is a guy that's dropping down from heavyweight to 205 pounds. You beat Rashad Evans and you essentially could be f fighting for the light heavyweight championship of the world. So it just depends on the opponents and the type of performances that you have. Here's a scenario from what you're talking about. Say Jose Aldo and Anthony Pettis, they agree to this lightweight title fight and it's announced for 4th of July weekend. And then there's some kind of setback. Pettis isn't ready for July. He can't make it for that date. Jose Aldo has effectively said that he's vacating the featherweight title. The UFC has to move forward and likely go ahead with a Cub Swanson Chad Mendez fight. What do you do in that situation where Aldo, if I'm not getting the Pettis fight, I don't really want to move to lightweight. I've now vacated this title. I mean, that, it could create a lot of headaches here if that fight is announced and doesn't actually happen, which is exactly what happened a year ago. Yeah, I think it just comes down to Anthony Pettis. That's the, the question mark right now. I think the UFC will have those conversations with Pettis and his uh, team to ensure that he is going to be 100% ready if Jose Aldo decides, you know what, I'm going to vacate the title, leave the division, and move up to 155 pounds. I mean, he's a big guy. He talked about moving up for a number of years. And I think the UFC just has to wait. Yes, everybody wants to see a fight with uh, Cub Swanson and Chad Mendez. Do they want to see it for a title? I'm sure if Jose Aldo's not in that division. But I think the UFC has to kind of wait it out, see what happens with the, the Pettis-Aldo uh, situation first. And you talk about the 4th of July. There will be... 
fireworks between Aldo no, and look Anthony at Pettis. Human that's for UFC sure. promo reel here, John Ramdeen. <laughs> There's no doubt that that fight. I mean, it's any fight fan, a very very exciting fight on paper. Does that fight have enough that it can translate and be a, a very big successful business card for the UFC with these two guys? I mean. You want to sell two guys that are exciting in the ring, but we, we don't always see that correlate to big numbers on pay-per-view. And the UFC right now, they are in star-making mode right now. I think Anthony Pettis, you look at this guy, man, on paper, this guy just seems like can't miss in terms of making that connection. Yeah, I think the, the responsibility of the UFC, though, is uh, you, you just mentioned it. You, the, the fact is that Jose Aldo, not a lot of people, for some reason, tune into his pay-per-views. Everybody recognizes that he is the top five best pound-for-pound -pound fighters, maybe to ever compete. The guy is just so complete in every area of mixed martial arts, but for some reason people aren't tuning in to, to watch this do, do guy. Do people care about that outside of kind of our bubble, you know, pound for pound this, or, you know, guy that maybe you can tell everybody he's an incredible fighter. Sometimes that doesn't connect with people that are only watching. Maybe they'll buy a couple pay-per-views a year. They're following this along with all their other sports. It's just UFC is a small part of their world. Yeah, it's true, but it's the UFC's responsibility to kind of ram it down everybody's throats that the, you have to watch, you have to tune into this guy because he's a special athlete. He's absolutely murdered everybody in his division and he's a special athlete. And then you need the other guys in the class. You need John Jones talking about how good he is, Anderson Silva talking about how good he is, and you have to create interest that way. People on our YouTube comments, they yeah. don't like when you say people are murdering I, I, one yeah, another. That, look, at, this is what Jose Aldo does. Look what he did to Uriah Faber. Absolutely smashed this guy's legs apart. Ricardo Lamas didn't have any chance. I mean, Jose Aldo is just a different animal. He's John, figure of speech, Ramdeen. I'm John Pollock, and we've got more <laughs> Fight News Now Extra right now.